Welcome, my dear students, to my first video lecture from semester one of our two-semester general chemistry course entitled Chem 1210. I'm Dr. Mike Christiansen from Utah State University, and I'm excited to indoctrinate, <laughs> I mean, teach you about the wonderful world of chemistry. Chemistry is about more than just blowing stuff up, although we totally get to do that sometimes, and it's really cool. But why in the world would anyone want to study chemistry? Well, my best slash wordiest answer is that chemistry is a fundamental science devoted to studying the near infinite number of physical interactions that occur all around and inside of us. Chemistry is an essential bedrock field for anyone interested in pursuing scientific, engineering, or medical careers. Organic chemists like me, in particular, are the scientists in charge of inventing new ways of making medicines. With po proper accreditation, students with bachelor's degrees in chemistry can enjoy prosperous careers as industry researchers or public educators. Chemists that have more advanced degrees can teach in community colleges or universities, or they can work as industry research leaders, business professionals, patent attorneys, or political advisors, or roadies for the Rolling Stones. And what should you hope to gain by watching this endless series of video lectures? Wealth, power, and prestige, of course! No, I'm just kidding. Instead of all of that crap, what you'll actually learn if you watch and retain the information presented in this lecture series is, one, you'll understand the basic principles of general chemistry. Two, you'll be able to explain basic everyday chemical phenomena and apply your knowledge to solving real world problems. And three, you'll be able to explain why chemistry is important and how it applies to everyday life. Now, our text for this class, or for this YouTube lecture series, for those of you who aren't privileged enough to be taking this from me in person, will be Chemistry, the Central Science, 12th edition, by Brown, LeMay, Burston, Woodward, Murphy, and the entire cast of Friends. Now we get into the nitty-gritty. You'll see quickly that before every single lecture that I give, I always provide a punch list of things that you should be able to know how to do by the time this lecture is ended. Here's today's list. After this lecture, you should be able to define the following terms. Matter, element, atom, molecule, compound, pure substance, mixture, gas, liquid, solid, homogeneous versus heterogeneous, solution, physical change versus chemical change, and precision versus accuracy. You should also be able to classify substance according to figure 1.9 from our text have memorized the SI units shown in table 1.4, have memorized the following prefixes from table 1.5, milli, micro, nano, and kilo, and if given formulas, be able to interconvert between Kelvin, Fahrenheit, and Celsius scales. So with that said, let's launch into today's lecture. What is matter? Well, simply put, matter is anything that has mass and occupies space. What is an element? An element is the most basic unit of matter, unable to be broken down into smaller units through chemical means. Simple definition for that is elements are the things found on the periodic table. This leads perfectly well into my sharing a humorous chemistry joke that's been superimposed onto the funny picture of a cat. As you'll see by watching my video lectures, I really like these humorous chemistry cats, which I get from quickmeme.com. This one reads, do you have mass? Do you occupy space? If so, you matter. <laughs> All right. So my simple definition of an element was the things found on the periodic table. But what is the periodic table, you ask? Well, the periodic table is this. It's an organized table showing every chemical element known to humankind. By way of interest, did you know that 90% of the Earth's crust, including oceans and the atmosphere, is comprised of just five elements? These five are oxygen, silicon, aluminum, iron, and calcium. Separately, did you know that 90% of our bodies, as well as those of pretty much all other life that we know of, are comprised of just three elements? These elements are oxygen, carbon, and hydrogen. Isn't that neat? I thought so. <laughs> so now we hammer home some hardcore vocabulary, and honestly, Lecture one and the first few lectures of any general introductory science course are going to be a lot like this. Vocabulary, vocabulary, vocabulary. Why? Because you have to learn the language of science. And just like any language that you need to learn, there is tons of vocabulary. So here's our first term on this slide. Atoms. What is an atom? It is the infinitesimally small 
building blocks of matter. If we could zoom into something like our skin really closely, we would see that it's actually made up of various tissues which are comprised of individual cells. If we zoomed in further, we would see that these cells are made up of multiple complex structures which are then comprised of even smaller individual polymers. These polymers are, in turn, if we zoomed into those, we would see that they are made up of even smaller building blocks that are bonded together, which, if we zoomed in even further, we could see on the tiniest, most zoomed in perspective, are comprised of individual atoms, the tiniest building blocks of matter. Okay, technically there's some stuff that's even tinier than an atom, but I'll save that for a later lecture. Here are two photos of two different pure substances, iron, whose periodic table abbreviation is Fe, and silicon, whose pre periodic table abbreviation is SI. Assuming that these two samples pictured here were actually pure, we could surmise that this bar of iron is made up of nothing but zillions and zillions of different atoms of iron all bonded together. I realize that zillion isn't technically a word, but I'm going to use it anyway. Now similarly, we could say such a thing about this bar of silicon. Assuming that it doesn't contain any other contaminants in it, this metallic bar is comprised of zillions and zillions of individual silicon atoms all bonded together. Isn't that neat? Oh yeah! So that leads me to have to say this definition. The word is molecules. What is a molecule? It's substance made up of two or more atoms joined together. So now we know what atoms are, and we know what molecules are. What really are molecules? Well, as it turns out, molecules are basically things, as I said, that are made up of two or more atoms. Here are some models showing us a few different molecules. The first one is oxygen, which is actually made up of two different atoms of oxygen bonded together. The next one is water, which is made up of one oxygen atom, shown in red, and two hydrogen atoms, shown in white, bonded together. H2O. A third example I have is carbon dioxide, which we exhale. It's made of one carbon atom, shown here as a central black ball, bonded to two individual oxygen atoms, which are colored as red. Now I should specify here that there are actually two different kinds of molecules. Homonuclear molecules consist of two or more atoms of the same element bonded together. Compounds, in contrast, are molecules that are made up of two or more atoms of different elements bonded together. So in this example, oxygen is a homonuclear molecule because it's made up of two different oxygen atoms. They are the same element bonded together, while water and carbon dioxide are both considered compounds because each of them have multiple different kinds of elements bonded together. Here are a few different examples as well. This is a structural model of ethanol, which is also made up of multiple different elements bonded together. This one is ethylene glycol, and this one is aspirin. You can see that all of these substances are all compounds. Oxygen, once of course, is a molecule as well, but it's a homonuclear molecule because all the elements in it, which are two atoms of oxygen, are the same element. I hope that makes sense. All of these are molecules. One is homonuclear, and the other are all considered compounds. Now all molecules, be they homonuclear molecules or compounds, can exist in three general different physical states, gas, liquid, or solid. In this seascape image of an iceberg floating in water, we could imagine water molecules existing simultaneously in all three of these states. The ice is comprised of solid water, the ocean is made of liquid water, and we could imagine there are actual gaseous water molecules floating around in the air. So I ask you, generally speaking, in which state of matter, gas, liquid, or solid, are the individual molecules furthest apart? In which state do you think they are second furthest apart? And in which state do you think they're closest together, gas, liquid, or solid? I'm not going to answer the question, but I want you to think about it. And now for some more vocabulary. Strictly speaking, a pure substance is a collection of matter in which all of the molecules are the same throughout. These molecules can either be made up of a single element or a single compound throughout. Here are some examples. Once again, we've seen iron before. 
this is sort of a model showing very, very closely all of the individual iron atoms bonded together. You can see that if there are no other substances in there, no other molecules other than individual iron atoms bonded together, this would be considered a pure substance. By comparison, table salt, sodium chloride, is actually a compound. It's made up of sodium atoms, which are abbreviated periodic table E, as Na, and chloride ions, which are abbreviated as Cl. Sodium and chloride gets together and forms this compound, table salt. If we have a big pile of table salt and there are no other compounds or elements in it other than Na and Cl bonded together, then we would say that that pile of table salt is a pure substance. This shows a zoomed in model of what an individual cluster of sodium chloride would look like. Pure substance contrast with mixtures. In mixtures we find collections of matter in which the materials present are made up of two or more pure substances, which can either be elements or compounds. Most of the stuff that we interact with every day are mixtures. I've shown this in this example, which is a zoomed up picture of a granite countertop. Granite is comprised of multiple different pure substances, both elements and compounds, all mixed together. Mixtures can be one of two types, either homogeneous or heterogeneous. Homogeneous mixtures are mixtures that are uniform throughout. In other words, the various things in them have all been uniformly dispersed or spread out uh, perfectly evenly. Homogeneous mixtures are also sometimes called solutions. Now, heterogeneous mixtures are mixtures that are not uniform throughout. So the individual things in them are not evenly spread out or evenly dispersed throughout the mixture. Heterogeneous mixtures can be easily separated, or the, comp the components of heterogeneous mixtures can often be easily separated by physical means. Now, this brings me to a sample lecture question that I'm going to ask you. Identify each of the following as being homogeneous or heterogeneous. Would tap water, dirt, and air. I'm not going to answer it to you, but we'll let you instead think about it on your own. One way that you can do so is by using this figure from our text as a guide. By going down this hierarchical diagram, you can easily classify any substance into the various subcategories shown here in these cute little pink boxes. <laughs> Enjoy! I think you'll have fun in this vocabularical minutia which leads us perfectly into our first lecture question from our problem set. A combination of sand, salt, and water is an example of a blank. I'm going to let you look at this and see if you can figure out what the answer is.